an opportunity to watch the program. Sing a new song to the Lord, he to whom wonders belong. Rejoice in his triumph and tell of his power. Oh, sing a new song to the Lord. Wow, wow Sister Des, what's that you're singing? I am singing a hymn. A hymn, interesting. That's mm -hmm. a very lovely song. What is a hymn? Oh, let me give you some history on hymns. In order for you to better understand what is a hymn, I think history will give you some perspective. So, for almost 2,000 years, Christians have used music in worship. This is also based on biblical admiration from writers such as Paul, and he counsels the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Let me continue. Wow. The word hymn comes from the Greek word hymnos, which means a song of praise. So what I was singing was a song, song of, of praise. praise. Yes. Now, originally, hymns were written in honor of the gods. But the hymn that I just sang was sung to the God of all gods. And the Lord of the lords. The Lord of all lords. Amen. And it was a new song. It was a new song. And it says, over the centuries, they have evolved and changed due to new thinking and developing religious belief throughout the history of the church. So today, we are benefiting from the history where hymns were developed to praise God, our Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen, Amen Sister Des. Amen, church. Happy Sabbath and welcome to Music Day celebration here as we focus on the theme in gratitude with hymns to him, hymns to him. And that is what we'll be doing here today. We'll be exploring how him has helped us and how him has helped the church over the years. And that's what we'll be doing here today. Sing a new song to the Lord. Amen, amen. amen. And you know what? There is a tradition we have in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in starting our Sabbath school worship service with hymns. hymns. Yes. And so at this moment, we are going to invite the band to lead the church yes. in a number of hymns. And we invite you, brethren, as you hear these hymns, to sing along with the band. Amen.
and amen. Let the congregation say, amen. amen, amen. Now, in case you're wondering who are these two people that are speaking with you, my name is Desiree McFarlane, and I'm from the Portmore Seventh-day Adventist Church. And um, here is Brother Sean Williams, also from the Portmore Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we are part of the music department. And so we are happy to join you here this morning as part of your music day. And we love hymns. Yes, we do. We, we love singing hymns. We, we actually host a hymns by request online program called The Reason I sing, and there are many reasons to sing and give thanks to the Lord. What do you say? Amen. Amen. So, just before we have the opening song, Brother Sean, I want you to tell us a little bit about how hymns have been helping the church. Yes, indeed. And we just heard some lovely hymns being played by the band. They played, This Is My Father's World. They played, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. And they played, Praise to the Lord. It was, it was an English non-conformist conformist minister called Isaac Watts. He started the revolution of congregational singing in the church. And he believed that hymns, should express the thoughts and the feelings of the people. What are the thoughts and feelings that inspire you today? Mine's are, great is thy faithfulness. It is well. Be not dismayed what ear be tied. There is a quiet place. These are the, some of my favorite hymns. And I know you have your favorites too. These hymns express our thoughts and beliefs and feelings not just New Old Testament concepts. Isaac Watts has been described as the liberator of the English hymn writing, as his hymns moved people away from simply singing old hymnal, Old Testament psalms to inspirational songs. In the same period, another significant movement affected the singing of hymns, the Methodist Church, led by John Wesley. Wesley, especially his brother Charles, simply used him simp and simple rhythms and singable melodies to improve congregational singing. They wrote many of our well-known hymns that are still very popular today. All right. Yes. Great, great. And this morning, one of the hymns that the Seventh-day Adventist Church love to sing is the church has one foundation and our praise team is going to lead us now in the singing of this beautiful hymn.
I invite you to remain standing and take your hymns in hand as we are going to read our script alternately from 330, Take My Life and Let It Be. We are going to read the first verse and we're going to read alternate and then together we will do the last verse. Hymn number 330 will not be singing, we will be reading. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love, at the impulse of thy love. Take and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold. Not a mite would I withhold. Not a mite would I withhold. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart and let thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. And we'll read together. Take my love, my Lord, I pour. At thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Ever only all for thee. The inspiration for this hymn came from Psalm 90 and verse 12. And now we will also sing a hymn as the prayer, hymn number 517. And the praise team will lead us in this hymn as we pray to God. Let us pray. Five, five one seven.
Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Wow, Sister Des, we have just used hymns, just hymns, mm -hmm. to pray. Mm -hmm. And we use hymns to express the thoughts in the scriptures. How yes. amazing is that? It is absolutely amazing. Yes. And sometimes we do not have appreciation for the hymns we sing until we close our eyes just now and really concentrate on, on what words. we are singing. Yes. How many times we just sing a song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, but we really do not believe that God is yes. faithful. Yes, indeed. We just repeat it because we know it. So opportunities like these, when we're focused, help us to get the message that God has in store. Yes, and that's why I'm going to give you a challenge. When you go home this evening, just take the opportunity or do in your morning or evening worship and just read the hymns. Don't sing it. Read the words and appreciate the messages in the songs. Yes, and we are now going to have the rendition of a very special hymn, one of my favorites, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, Amen. by the Men's Chorale.
Amen. 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 Yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes. A mighty fortress is our is God. Is our God. Yes. We say thanks to the men's chorale for singing that song so powerfully. Thank Amen. you. Amen. 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 We have reached a critical time in our service. We are going into the lesson review. review. It's going to be a summary. Now, the adult and children's lesson will be done by Dr. Rose Evans. We will have the children's lesson, same as the adults. We'll also have the primary lesson, Sweet Promises Given by Robin and Jordan Jack. We'll have the junior's lesson, Praise to the Lord the Almighty by Jaden Russell. And finally, we'll have Real Time, Fairest Lord Jesus by Laniel Mattis. It's now time for the lesson, lesson review. review. Sabbath church are you ready to study yes though it's a brief rule that we'll be doing this morning nevertheless it will not be less impactful it just means that we may just facilitate one or two questions or comments so as we go through if you have a burning question or comment you may say it so this week we look at a very interesting lesson entitled Contrary Passages. And to contextualize the lesson, frame it up, what we will be doing is looking at some of the passages that were used in days of hold, misinterpreted to support the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. Have you ever heard of immortality of your soul? Put up your hands, let me see. Oh, very good, so we know about that. The immortality of the soul is a doctrine that states that when man dies, when any of us die, immediately our soul is regenerated into other living forms and we exist among others on earth and that's why you will hear that people say that their dead mother dreamed them and tell them careful of your neighbors they are not good have you ever heard that let me tell you something it's good when we can apply the lesson because this doctrine immortality of the soul it does not stand alone, but what it does 
is to prevent a lot of people from accepting Jesus. And I want us to understand today that as I search the web on the Bible, the web says that most of Christendom believe in the immortality of the soul. But our prophetess, Sister White, in Evangelism, page 247 says that the immortality of the soul doctrine is a lie that was crafted by Satan himself to prevent us from entering into the kingdom. Why is that so? Can anybody tell me why is it that you think that this doctrine is a lie? Just one person. I'm not hearing. Give him the mic, please. Okay. So, this doctrine is a lie. And we don't need a lot of scriptures to prove that. If we turn our Bibles to Genesis 2, verse 7, we will see that the soul is the entire human being because God says he formed man from the dust of the earth and he breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living soul. So the breath which we refer to as the spirit and the dust, the body, is one, is one. So you cannot have one going one way and the other part going another way. At that time, man would be destroyed. And then we know that we are mortal according to the Bible. There are many texts that speak to us human being as having mortality. And Romans 5 verse 12 is one of them. As Paul said, by sin, by one man, sin entered the world and so death has passed on all men so ecclesiastes say that all of us must die once we live long enough so we see that this doctrine is not true and we must learn to accept truth otherwise we will be deceived and that is the reason why the memory verse in john 5 verse 39 says Jesus said to the disciples, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. Yet, these scriptures testify of me, but you will not come unto me. And what it says when we study the Bible, if we do not believe the truths that are revealed, then we are going to deceive in believing a lie. And that was what Sunday's lesson was saying about the rich man and Lazarus the dead rich man was in hell as you have read and the dead poor man Lazarus was in the dead bosom of Abraham and so the story is told that when hell gets hotter that the rich man cried unto Abraham saying please send Lazarus to preach unto my people who are living on earth that they may accept the gospel. So it was not speaking about the state of the dead. But what this passage was actually highlighting was what the memory text says in John 5 verse 39 and 40. 40 says, if you do not believe the truth when you hear it, there is coming a time even if somebody should rise from the dead and come and tell you, you are not going to believe. So what is the implication of this text or this passage? When truth is presented unto us, we should readily accept it so that we can be saved. And when Jesus come, we can have eternal life. Another passage on the Mondays that is controversy is that is Luke 23 42 and 43 when the thief who was on the cross and his heart was pricked by Jesus's ministry 
And while they were both there and another thief, the thief said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. Philosophers and some believe that the thief and Jesus went to heaven the very same day. Because Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise. So some scholars are rightly interpreted that Jesus was saying, look, today I am telling you, mark my words, you shall be with me in paradise. But some misinterpreted to say, today you shall be with me in paradise. But I ask you the question, what happened? What would have happened if the thief and Jesus went to paradise the same time after he, they died on the cross? What do you think would happen? All of us would have no hope. Very good. Because Jesus would not have been buried. If he was not buried, what would happen? There would be no resurrection. And if there's no resurrection, what happened? Paul said, we have no hope. So, we, so you realize, brethren, that many texts in the Bible are misinterpreted. Now, if I am immortal, why should I accept Christ? I already have immortal life. So there's no need to accept Christ. And that is what this doctrine is. This is the intent of the doctrine. We, are we have an immortal soul, so there's no need to accept Christ. Another one is the one spoken of in 1 Peter, Philippians 1 verse 21 and 24. To depart and be with Christ on the Tuesday. Paul was going through some excruciating time. He was going through his crucibles and he was tired and he said, I desire to depart and be with Christ. And some interpreted this to say that Paul was saying when he died, he, his soul would go to heaven immediately. But brethren, adults, let me ask you a question. Haven't you, sometime in your life, when you're going through your problems, you desire that you would die and just rest from your cares and your labor? That was the same situation with Paul. So it is not saying that Paul wanted to ascend and to be regenerated into some immortal beings that cannot exist, coexist like us human beings. But that being would live in some cave or in heaven or in hell because the Bible does not teach that. But what Paul later says, in 1 Timothy 4 verse 8, I have fought a good fight. I have what? Finished the work. Henceforth there is laid up for me what? A crown of righteousness which what? The Lord shall give when? At his appearing. When he comes the second time. So Paul himself is preaching against the immortality of the soul. In 1 Corinthians 15, he also said, Brethren, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but this mortal shall what? Put on immortality. When will that be done? At the last what? Trump of God. When the dead shall rise. So brethren, Paul himself tells us that that misinterpretation is wrong. It is a lie. We must accept Jesus and still look forward to his second coming. And another one is found on the Wednesday, preaching to the spirits in prison. And today we talk a lot about spirits. And let me tell you something, brethren. This doctrine of immortality of the soul is so pervasive and so destructive that many people are tormented or believe that they're tormented by spirits. And as we come down a few minutes to go, 
I just want to share an experience with you to show you how far reaching this doctrine that the soul has emerged into some other spirits and live beings and going to and fro in the earth. I went to work one morning and a customer called me and said, come Miss Vicky, I want to tell you something. And I sat there for one full hour listening to the lady. She's about 80 odd years of age. And she said, my husband died and my aunt died. And Miss Vicky, I cannot sleep in the house. I can see them coming in at nights. I can't eat, Miss Vicky. I have no life within me. And then she said to me, can you sell me some frankincense and myrrh and sulfur? Now, brethren, I'm going to show you the implication of this doctrine. When you are tormented, brethren, you cannot have peace with Christ. And Jesus said, I come to give you peace. My peace I leave with you. So if we believe in the spirits, if we believe in the souls going around and doing all kinds of things, brethren, we cannot settle in our faith in Jesus Christ. But not only that, there are environmental destruction because when we burn the frankincense and myrrh and the sulfur, it destroys the environment. People get sinusitis and asthmatic attack. So brethren, it's important that we believe the truth of God's words. And then we look at the souls, crying out under the altar in Thursday's lesson. Here, brethren, John, the revelator, he got a vision. What did I say, brethren? He got a what? A vision. And he saw souls that were martyred. They were killed for the gospel's sake. Because they stood up for their faith, they were killed. And they were crying, how long will you avenge our blood upon those who have killed us? Some misinterpreted this to say, look, this is saying that those souls immediately went to heaven. They are at the altar of God crying. But the passage is symbolic, as you know, many things in Revelation is symbolic of prophecies that ought to be fulfilled. Yes, brethren, when God came down and asked Cain about his brother, God said to Abel, your, Cain, your brother's blood has cried and come up to me in heaven. That's a symbolism. Brethren, what God wants us to do is not to believe fables, but to believe in the true word of God. And secondly, brethren, before we close off, is that these souls under the altar is symbolic, but nevertheless, the altar in the Bible represents the offering of sacrifices. And this morning, I'd like to remind you that Jesus sacrificed himself for us. And Paul called us to say, look, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So brethren, as you search the scriptures, do not believe like the Jews. Believe in God, believe the truth, and you shall be saved. Good morning, everyone, and, ha and happy Sabbath. My, na my name is Jordan Jack. And my name is Robin Jack. And today we'll be doing the primary lesson review. The story is based on when Jesus keeps his promises. One way Jesus kept his promise was when a prophet told Israel that there would be a king who would, who would rule, o, rule, rule over. And 7,000 years later, a 
baby was a baby was born and he will help all of us and remember the one with the good shepherd Jesus said he will he is the shepherd and we will be the sheep isn't that a promise yes it is a promise that has been fulfilled Since we are coming to the end, we will be doing our hymn. The hymn is hymn 600, Hold Fast Till I Come. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath to you all. I will be reviewing the PowerPoint lesson with you. Lesson number nine. The topic is giving God the credit. Nehemiah knew that the best way he could serve those around him was to remind them of how faithful God has always been. People need that same reminder today. We are being God's servant when we continue to tell those around us of his leading in his church and in our own lives. We serve God when we tell others what he has done for us. Praise to the Lord. 
all who hear now to his temple draw near. Please turn your hymnals to hymn number one, Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Second Corinthians 9, verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgefully or of necessity, for God's love, God loves a cheerful giver. Our beliefs, number 21, on stewardship, we are God's stewards entrusted by him with time and opportunities, abilities and possession, and the, the blessing of the earth and its resources. We are responsible to him for their proper use. We acknowledge God's ownership by faithful service to him and our fellow human beings, and by returning tithes and giving offerings for the proclamation of his gospel and the support of the growth in his church. Understanding and learning to practice biblical money management is not something you can learn in a week's Sabbath school lesson. If you have an interest, you can ask your youth pastor or parents to help you find some helpful materials. But the first step you can take by yourself is that you can read the Bible about what it says on the relationship with God and money, and you can work on your financial attitude. Attitudes are determined by your personal choices in every situation. Put God first and use money and everything else, knowing that everything comes from and belongs to him. Use the acronym TRUST to help you out. T, take inventory of all your assets. R, recognize that God is the source of everything. U, understand your biblical principle of money. S, surrender everything to God. And T, test God's promise to take care of you. Please turn your hymns to hymn number 240.
and order. Glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forevermore be thine. Brother Sean, what I love most about this is that our children are learning the hymns. They are learning, and if you take messages and inspiration from the first hymn that was shared, yes, sweet promise is, is given. given to all who believe. Amen. And the Lord is saying, hold fast till I come. Yes. Hold fast till I come. Wonderful and, messages in him. And while I have no problem with contemporary music, I believe that the messages in the hymns are the ones that really sustain us. Yes, there is a hymn for every season. Every season, every season. Every situation. Yes. And so we have now the sanctuary choir who is going to bless our hearts with what a wonderful savior and Amen. it's going to be a medley. Let's listen to them. worshiping the Lord today the glorious almighty God if you have come to give him gratitude let me hear you say hallelujah Yes, sir. 
wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord oh marvelous oh wonderful if God has been wonderful to you let me hear you say praise the Lord praise that's right you know I was sitting here and thinking in 2020 I didn't see this possibility again am I the only one but God amen God what a wonderful Savior is Jesus my Jesus what a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Now, this is the time that I share with you one of my favorite hymns. 
we are winding down. We are almost there, almost there. Now, in at the beginning, you heard me singing a hymn, and I'm going to ask you to turn your hymnals to hymn number 33. Hymn number 33. Now, I know many of you have favorite hymns. Am I speaking the truth? Yes. Um, sweet promises given. You know, um, the one that says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. What a friend we have in Jesus. What about God will take care of you? Yes, we have favorite hymns. But a couple of years ago, somebody taught me this hymn. And I want to teach you this morning. So I am going to sing the first verse and you're going to catch it and then you are going to sing the rest of the verses with me, right? Are you ready? All right. Sing a new song to the Lord He to whom wonders belong Rejoice in his triumph and tell of his power oh sing a new song to the lord join with me now second verse now to the ends of the earth see his salvation is shown and still other responsibilities you understand I'm not so I want to thank you so much for your participation and as today as we reflect on the hymns I'm inviting the praise team to come as we close out Sabbath school this morning I want you to contemplate these words I want you to contemplate these words Christ as for sin atonement made what a wonderful savior we are redeemed the price is what paid what a wonderful savior and the song goes on to say what a wonderful savior is jesus my jesus what a wonderful savior is jesus my lord whatever you are going through remember you have a savior and you have a lord the praise team will take us out of sabbath school god bless you right before, right before we sing this song i'm going to ask all the ushers to prepare to collect the sabbath school offering right before we sing hymn 92 this is my father's word hymn number 92 Ushers, please stand by.
going to get in the attitude of prayer at this time. You may have come here this morning with all your varying concerns, and this is the time that we are going to lift our concerns before the Lord. But before we do so, just sing with me, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Shall we pray? Kind Father and our God, how great thou art, how great thou art. We thank you, Lord, for this blessed Sabbath that we can come into your courts to lift praises unto you, Lord, on this our music day. We want to thank you, Father, for those who have ministered before, and we thank you for those who will be coming after May as the praises go up, Lord, may the blessings come down on our souls. We thank you so much for taking us throughout the past week. Many of us, Lord, we had a difficult week, but through it all, we can say that you have been with us. And we want to praise you, we want to lift your name on high this morning. Lord, as we come, we just want to place our children before you. Lord, you know each and every one, and you know their circumstance. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll minister to their needs today. Lord, we ask that as they go about daily, as they go to school, that, Lord, you will build and hedge around them, protect them from the evils, O oh God, that exist. And we pray, O oh, Heavenly Father, that they will witness for you even as they go from day to day. We want to place our youths before you, O oh God challenges are there but we want to thank you for the victories that they have gained and we pray God that you'll open doors for them Lord that no man can shut and that Lord you will shut doors that will not bring honor and glory unto your name we thank you so much Lord for those who have finished their studies I recall uh, I recall Joel and I recall um, Sister Deja we thank you that they have stood it out and that, Lord, they can praise your name for having blessed them to have completed their studies. And for those who are close, close to finishing, we ask, Lord, that you continue to bless them, continue to provide the means for them so that, Lord, they will be able to come through. And for those who have, are having challenges, we pray, God, that you will open up doors for them father that they cannot even dream of lord we ask that you bless your young people in a very special way it's hard lord it's hard it's difficult because there are so many temptations there are so many challenges there are so many things that try to wow them away from you but god we pray like the hebrew boys we pray god that they'll stand in a time of trial lord we want to place our older members before you lord we have been on this journey for quite a while now we pray god that god that you'll help us not to get battle weary but god we pray that you'll help us to hold on to you for those who have not been coming out for a while lord we place them before you and we ask that you continue to minister unto their souls 
We remember Sister Shaw. We remember Sister Levy. We remember Sister Roper. Remember Brother Reed, Sister Reed. Remember all of your people, Lord, who have not been able to gather back into your sanctuary. Pray that the same blessing that you offer us in the physical space, that Lord, even as they join us online, that you'll offer the same blessings unto them. Lord, in a very special way, we want to place those who mourn before you at this time. And Lord, we want to remember Brother McLeod who has lost his daughter. Be that comfort, be that strength for him at this time. We pray for Sister Emmeth, Lord, whose mother is in the hospital. We ask, Lord, that you'll visit with her at this time. Send your minister and angels of healing, Lord, to touch her even at this time. We pray for Sister Emmett's grandson who is not doing well. You are the balm in Gilead, Lord, and you have said that there's nothing that is too hard for you. So we place them before you at this time. Lord, we ask that you remember Sister Markland. Oh, God of heaven, touch down in the hospital even now. And Lord, we pray that you restore her so that, God, she can continue to work for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we bless your name and we pray for our communities around us at this time. We pray for all those, Lord, who are involved in illegal activities, that, Lord, as you met Saul on the, on the road to Damascus, that, God, you send a light from heaven. Shine upon them, Lord, and tell them that they will turn from their wicked ways and that, Lord, they will seek you. Help us, oh God, that we will evangelize and that, Lord, our lives will be powerful testimonies for you so that men and women can see truly, Lord, that you are a God to be served. So we pray, Lord, that you'll visit our communities, rescue some souls, oh God, from the pit of, of sin and God of heaven. Help, Lord, that men and women will see that time is wrapping up. It's no time to joke now because, Lord, you are even at the doors. So as we continue to worship you, Lord, on our music day, we ask Heavenly Father that, oh God, you will help each and every one who render a, a, a rendition for you, that, Lord, it will be a ministry and souls will be blessed today. So, Lord, take control now. Take control of the communication department. Take control of each equipment. Grant us clarity, Lord, so that, God, we can worship you in the beauty of holiness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, church. You're looking very good down there. I'm liking what I'm seeing. We have a full house this morning. And I hope that, you know, going forward, this will be the new norm. I just want to thank you for coming out as we worship under the theme in, great, in grateful with hymns for him. In gratitude, sorry, with hymns for him. I'd like to also welcome those who are watching online. I, a special blessing awaits you as we fellowship together. Now, for some general announcements, um, an update on Harvest and Gathering. We have, at the moment, we have... The to a total of $85,650, representing 58% of the 2020 goal. Now, this is the last Sabbath, and, you know, projections were showing that we were trending in the right direction, but, you know, we're, we're falling a bit short, so I'm encouraging, or encouraging you to, you know, commit, have your harvest and gathering commitments ready as we give to the furtherance of God's work. Be, please be aware that next week's Sabbath is Stewardship Day for the Central Jamaica Conference. And this Sabbath marks the last Sabbath in Youth Month. And I just want to extend, you know, gratitude to our youth who led out so ably this month. Amen? You know, they did well. They did very well. And... You know, it's, it's, we're doing this for God. It's not for ourselves, but it's for God. And, you know, just, I'm just inviting you to continue to pray for us as youth as we continue to work for him. On a little sad note, 
brother and sister Evans. Sister Evans did the lesson this morning. She did very well. She, they will be leaving us, unfortunately, next week, Wednesday, and we want to give them an extra special goodbye. I'd like to invite them, Sister Evans, Brother Evans. Oh, oh, okay. All right, so pastor is going to, you know, endorse that, that um, their departure, but, you know, sister, brother and sister Evans, is, this is very personal for me, especially brother Evans, he, you know, he encouraged me a lot while I was in school. Well, I'm still currently in school, but he encouraged me at the beginning, and I just want to, you know, thank him brother and sister Evans for their service to the Sydney Seventh-day Adventist Church and wish them all the best. On to some unfortunate death announcements. You know, church, if, if my, please excuse me if my haircut is not looking that good this morning because my barber, unfortunately, when I went yesterday to, for my regular haircut, I found out that he passed, and what's even more unfortunate, I heard that he was the nephew of our dear sister Anne-Marie Smith, and I heard this morning that she's not taking the loss so well, so I'm asking you please to keep her in our prayers. Also, onto some Sick announcements, Sister, Markla, Sister Markland, Marcia Markland, was involved in an accident this week, and she's in the hospital. Please keep her in our prayers. Also, Sister Emmett Thomas's mother, Sister Beatrice White, is in the hospital, and I heard that she's not doing so well. I'm asking you to keep her in your earnest prayer, and she also asked me this morning to for us to pray for her grandson who is not feeling so well and is also in hospital, please, 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 church, keep them in our, in our prayers. I'll now hand off to, to our pastor, Pastor Nathan Jackson, but after which I'll ask Sister Elder Duncan, Sister Berlin Duncan, to do a special prayer for Sister Thomas and Sister Markland, as well as Sister Anne-Marie Smith, as they are going through some tough time. Please permit this prayer as we pray for them and encourage them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. This is indeed the day God has made. And as his people walking in obedience, we will rejoice and be glad in it. It is music day, and it is so sweet and so invigorating to be in the house of the Lord today. Am I right? And I'm sure that you have been blessed and you will continue to be blessed as we worship and fellowship throughout this blessed Sabbath. Just before I re-emphasize some important notation, I'm going to just invite all the persons who are from Hill Run who are worshiping with us just to stand briefly for a moment. All those from Hill Run. Hill Run, please stand. All right, here they are. Put your hands together for them. We are exceedingly glad to have you running up the hill to be with us today. And I know that you enjoy the journey up, and you will even more enjoy your time with us worshiping today. We trust and hope that you will come again and come soon. And we look forward to the day when we will continue to be there with you and that we'll be able to worship down Hill Run for an entire Sabbath as we seek to establish a presence there. My brothers and sisters, God 
is good. The work of the Lord continues amidst the challenges that we face on every hand. We have nothing to fear, for Jesus promises that he will be with us to the very end. All he asks us to do is to trust him and keep walking in faith. Just before I do the substantive matter that I am here to deal with is I want you to be reminded of the fact that we have some persons who continues to move, who continue to move to and fro. The Evans family, brother and sister Evans, are they here this morning? I'm going to invite them to stand. Are they here? If you are here, there is Brother Evans, there is Sister Evans. Well, well, well. Is Sister Frances here? Remain standing, the Evans family. Sister Frances, is she here today? No? Where, where are you? Please stand. Oh, she's standing already. Good. You'll have to help me see because I'm away from you. All right. These three persons, I ask them to stand because brother and sister heavens are very much on their way out, leaving us, migrating to Canada. Sister Frances is also on her way out, migrating to America. But as you seek to go, we want you to know that you will always be in our hearts. And I know that we too will always be in your hearts. We will not send your membership right now. So don't ask for it too quickly. But if your membership is with us, it means that you have to report to us. So we want you to report to us. Let us know how you are getting on and that we can continue to pray for you every day. All right? We wish you well, and in giving the final prayer, I will ask God's blessing in a special way upon you. You may be seated, and God be with you as you prepare to migrate. Sister Markland, you have been informed of her sad experience, but let us keep her before the throne of grace. God hears the answers prayer, and there is nothing too hard for the Lord to do. Remember, leaders, council will be on the 19th of the 12th, 22, and it's going to be held at Camp Verley site. That's leaders council on the 19th, the 18th, not the 19th, the 18th is the day after camp. And it's going to be held at Camp Verley. So please take up that as an item for announcement continuously going forward. Also, we have our camp and the Preachers Institute that will start on the 17th, on the 14th, and it goes through to the 17th of December. We need to have delegates to represent us at these two meetings, and we are in the process of identifying and selecting delegates to these meetings. Also, it is open. It's going to be at Camp Verley, so people close by, you can go in, even if you have to drive back in the nights, so you don't have to stay away. You can go in, enjoy the blessings, and even enjoy the blessings of being at home. Heritage Quiz. The Jamaica Union Heritage Quiz, which is an annual experience, will be held next Sabbath afternoon at 3.30 p.m. right here at the Sydenham Seventh-day Adventist Church. I think we are the champions, and I think, again, Central Jamaica Conference will have a representative at that quiz in a person that we have from Sydenham Church. We pray and hope that if it is held here, that there is no way we are going to allow anybody else to be crowned champion. We are going to remain as champion. That's next Sunday, next Sabbath, 
3 p.m. in the afternoon, and we are asking everybody to come out and to support so that we can have a grand time. All right, let me ask now, is my candidate here for baptism as yet? He's here. All right, I'm going to ask that he comes just for the... Okay. All right, the candidate is changing, so give him a little more time. But what we are going to be doing then is to pray for the Evans and the Francis's family as they prepare to leave us. One, one group, one set for Canada, the other person for the United States of America. I'm going to invite them again to stand as we pray for them. The Evans family and the Francis family. Please stand. The others will bow your heads where you are as prayer is offered now. The Evans, you are going to, I'm going to ask you to stand and also Sister Francis. Remain standing for the prayer. Good. The rest of us remain seated, heads bow. Father in heaven, you are the God of the universe and your eyes go through and through and through throughout the entire world. There is nothing hidden from you and we are thankful, Lord, to know that you are our God and that you are our best friend. This morning, as a community of believers, we stand thanking you for the presence the services and the blessings we have enjoyed from the Evans family and from your daughter, Sister Frances. Whilst they have been with us, they have encouraged us to walk with you. And I trust that we have been a source of encouragement to them as they abide in your grace. Now as they leave, migrating to foreign countries, we ask, O oh God, that you will continue to be their stay, their comfort, their guide, that you will protect them and keep them with us so ever they will go, that they will always seek to do your will, to honor you and to glorify your name. Give them good health. Provide for them and supply their needs. Help that O oh Lord, Others will see Christ in them, and they too will be led into a saving relationship with you. I pray, O oh God, that they will remain true, they will remain faithful, and they will be, as you want them to be, lights that will shine for you, even amidst the darkness of our age. The Lord God be with you. He blessed you. He makes his face shine upon you. He gives his Holy Spirit and he gives you his wonderful truth settled in your hearts so that whatever happens, you will stand on the dust, said the Lord. To this end, may the Lord bless and keep you all. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. The candidate is ready now. As we continue in prayer, I just ask that you assume an attitude of prayer as we petition our throne of grace. Great Father and our God, what a God you are. You care about every aspect of our lives. This morning, Lord, I come just to talk to you on behalf of especially Sister White and the grandson of Sister Emmett Thomas, Lord, you know what their situation is because you are the balm in Gilead and you are the great physician. You are our great healer. Lord, we have seen your handiwork in their lives before. So we come with boldness and confidence. 
presence this morning, trusting, Lord, that you'll continue your healing work in their lives. Father, we lift up also Sister Markland, she was praying for. But Lord, we know that what the situation is and we continue to look to you. Remember, Lord, even Deacon McLeod, who is mourning the loss of his daughter and all the family members. Lord, be with your people. So many sorrows, so many sickness, so many death. But what a day it will be when sickness and death and suffering and pain will be over. It will be joy and peace. So this morning, Lord, we ask that you'll continue with your healing. We ask that you'll continue with your peace. Continue to comfort. Continue to strengthen your people as we say thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. The candidate is now through changing. Just want to go through their bridge forms of vows with him. And Pastor Sean will be going into the water to perform the baptismal rite for us today. Is the candidate ready? Okay. All right, Sean. All right, Sean. You can just stay. All right. All right, Sean, I know that soon and very soon you'll start preaching from the pulpit. We're happy to have you. Sean Philemon Richards is our candidate for today. And let me hear the church say amen. I'll just give you three questions. To, I'll ask you three questions and then you'll answer by raising your hand once you are in agreement with these three questions. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord? And do you desire to live your life in a saving relationship with Him? Amen. Do you accept the teaching of the Bible as expressed in the Scripture of fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and do you pledge by God's grace to live your life in harmony with these teachings? Amen. And the final question is, do you desire to be baptized as a public expression of your faith in Jesus Christ, to be accepted into the fellowship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? and to support the church and its mission as a faithful steward by your personal influence, your tithes and offerings, and a life of service. Amen. Brothers and sisters, and this is now for members of this congregation, those who are visiting with us, we are happy to have you, but it's not, your, it's not for you to participate right now. Members of this church, You've heard and you've seen Brother Sean answering these questions in the affirmative. Is there such a motion now that he be accepted as a member of this church subject to his baptism? And the motion is moved. Is there a second for the motion? It is being overwhelmingly second. Now members, all in agreement with the motion, moved and seconded, please put up your hands. Wow, that's beautiful, Sean. Everybody is happy for you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, 
your grace has proven to be marvelous in the lives of our people. And today we are witnesses of the triumphs of the gospel. As your son, Sean Richards, publicly take his stand for you in baptism. You have been good to him and you have led him this far. And we are confident that you will lead him to the very end. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will baptize him anew. You will abide in his heart. You will recreate and reproduce within him a character that is reflective of yours. Oh God, may each day he enjoys his walk with you. And as he does, may he invite others to join him on this wonderful experience so that others too will come to know you as their savior and accept you as their Lord. Bless this congregation, Lord, and help that the church will be warm. It will be a very, very fertile soil for him to grow and blossom in. And together, when you come in your kingdom, may all of us have the joy and the privilege to be saved, for we ask it in your precious name. Let the church say, Amen. All right, I don't know where the singers, we could have one, a chorus or so. As Pastor Sean Wilson is already in the pool, and Sean is now about to descend into the water for his baptism. Okay, it's... Night shift. All right, before the singers start, we're going to do the pronouncement. And now, my dear brother Sean, because of your love for Christ and your desire to make him Lord and master of your life, it is our desire as ministers of the gospel to baptize you now in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit, and everyone rejoicing with you say, Amen. To be free from the burden of sin, there is power in the blood, power in the blood. Power in the blood, there is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the
Join us in singing, Now Thank We All Our God, hymn 559. want to crown Jesus in your life today, then join us in singing as best as you can, as powerfully as you can, crown him Lord of all. Hymn 229.
Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. And it's been such a long time since we've seen each other. And as beautiful as usual. <laughs> That's so true, Auntie. But today is a good day for us to meet. Today is music day. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm excited too. And you know what? Many persons are here to celebrate with us. Yes, there are many persons here. Welcome, welcome everybody. God had, a, God had great things in store for us today. Of course, I believe that he has great things in store for us today. And you know what? Today we'll be using hymns as a medium through which to praise Jesus. Auntie, can you tell me 
a little more about him? Well, I'll try to tell you what I know. You know, when I, I did music class, they told us that hymns were spiritual songs. You know, we have other spiritual songs that may not be hymns, but hymns usually have verses like stanzas and a chorus and um, refrain and all of that, right? And our church has basically, we have been using hymns for a long time to the point where we have an old hymn that we call the old hymn now, now that we're using before. And then we had to switch, and now we have the new hymnal, right? And these hymns were written based on people's experiences through life. When they went through some experiences with Jesus that were so overwhelming or exciting, or they saw him delivering them, they would write a hymn about it. And then today, we get to share in their experiences, and we can even identify with them, don't you, church? Yes, because when we are going through some things, we can look at some hymns and say, but wait, this person seems like he or she knew about what I was going to experience and wrote these things for me, but guess what? It was God who inspired it, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so, you know, the next thing I want to say, many people, when they are going through problems, you know what they do? They pray, right? I ask the church to pray for them. But you know what they do when God works? Some of them do what when God works all things for them? They keep a dance. Keep session. When things are going bad, you know, you hear the gospel music ringing out. But when things are good, they keep session. Isn't that unfortunate? Well... We have a different plan today. We are here to praise the Lord. When I point to you, say hallelujah. Say praise the Lord. And say thank you, Jesus. We're gonna do that again. What should they say, Ezene? First thing we're going to say is? Hallelujah. Let me hear it. Hallelujah. Come on, man. God deserves more than that. What are we going to say? Hallelujah. Direct them again, SNA. Direct your choir. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And you say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody. Say, bless the, Lord. bless the Lord. Amen. God is worthy to be praised, right? Mm -hmm. All right, you know, um, we have a song that we're going to sing, and the praise team is there ready to lead us out in this song because we are going to give God the praise. You know, today we're going to give God the credit for everything that he has done in our lives. You know, many times we give the other people the credit, like they say, boy, thank you for getting me the job, but God was behind that, right? Or we might say, boy, thank you for coming in in such a time and bringing the food when I needed it. Who was behind it? God who inspired them. So today we're giving God the credit. And yes, when God is in charge of our lives, whether it's good or we think it's bad, we still need to give God the praise. Because God does not allow anything to happen to his children without him giving permission. Do you agree with me? And when our lives is hidden, are hidden Christ, even when bad things happen, we know that whatever the devil had planned for evil, God meant it for good. So let us praise the Lord, brethren. Now we're going to sing the hymn 221, Rejoice the Lord is King. Hymn 221. Praise the hymn. Take it away. Everybody, we're going to sing together.
everyone to stand as this Sister Renee Ferron sings the opening hymn. Glory, glory, 
Please remain standing as we have prayer. Our oh, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you brought us here today. Another day where we can give thanks for life, where we can lift you up and worship your holy name. We thank you for being such a wonderful God to us. I pray that you will send your holy angels to be among us today and your Holy Spirit. I pray also that as we sing these hymns of praise, our hearts might be lifted upwards, our minds and our thoughts will be so elevated that we get closer to you and others can see the experience that we've had with you today and want to come and praise your name and worship with us. I pray also for your manservant who will be giving us the brief sermon today that you will speak through him so that hearts can be blessed and that we will get the encouragement we need to go on in this life's journey. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Esane, do you know that even animals and plants and even things of our life praise their creator? Psalm, that is why Psalm 19 verse 1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God and, and what? The firmament which is the sky showeth its handiwork. Really, Auntie? Do you mean the bullfrog and the crickets are making sounds of praise sometimes? Of course. As a matter of fact, even when I go to the beach and I look at the sea, I say, wow, God, you really made this? You're so awesome. Our creator is so amazing. What? That we have to just burst into singing instead of talking. Sister Nakita will do just that. Amen.
And I think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. I want the cross. My burdens gladly bearing. Okay, so I'm going to invite everyone to stand so we can pray for the offering that has just been co 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 collected. We're going to sing all things come of the Lord and then I'll pray. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own. Lord, we thank you for accepting our gifts, and we ask that you will use it for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Please be seated. No, no. Auntie, that was such good singing. Yes. By the way, I would like to know who was Danny Frosby, Crosby. People talk about her sometimes when conversations about sim hymns comes up. Okay, Fanny Crosby. Well, I just know a little bit about her. I know that she was blind and she, she wrote many hymns. But somebody is here who is going to be telling us much more about Fanny Crosby. Do you want to hear about Fanny Crosby congregation? I want to hear. So, invite Sister Zoya Samuels to come and tell us about the great hymn writer, Fanny Crosby. Hello, everyone. I am Fanny Crosby. And today, I am at the Institute for the Blind in New York, where my journey to greatness all started. And so, I invite you to journey with me as we take a trip to the past. On March 24, 1820, my parents, John Crosby and Mary Crosby, gave birth to me in the small village of South
made an attempt to become enrolled in the Institute of the Blind, and I was successful. At this juncture of my life, I flourished. I developed my musical and writing skill sets. Having completed my tenure at this noble institution, I returned to give my service for 11 years as a classroom teacher. A few years later, I then took a brave step and went on the quest for love. I met and fell in love with the man of my dream, Alexander Alistine, who was also blind. At the age of 38, I handed him my hand in marriage. Our perfect marriage started falling apart and we eventually went our separate ways. In all of this, my musical career continued on the rise. And so I was dubbed as the queen of gospel songwriters, as the hymns penned were hymns of all time. Beautifully penned hymns such as All the Way My Savior Leads Me, Near to the Cross, and Rescue the Perishing. As time went by, however, I became ill and my health started to deteriorate. And so, at the age of 93, I succumbed to my illness and I took my last breath. I may be dead and gone, but my hymns of all time will forever live on. At this time, your ears will be blessed by the singing of two of my favorite hymns, Blessed Assurance and Jesus saves. My friends, may we live in the moment and make it so beautiful that it will be worth remembering. Fronnie Crosby. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, and oh, what a foretaste of glory divine.
nations now rejoice Jesus says oh Jesus says shout salvation full and free highest hills and deepest caves tis the song of victory Jesus says Jesus says Jesus says Jesus says Jesus says Amen Wow, Auntie. Those songs sound sounded really amazing. All right. Now, as an A, and they don't hear anything. Well, it's not finished. We have the group Sunshine Echoes, who are coming to sing for us. So that was a send from Spring Village Church. Good afternoon, everyone. Praise the Lord. Shall we praise the Lord, church? Come on, man. Shall we give a hallelujah to our Lord and reigning King? Psalm 37 and verse 25 says, I was young, but now I'm old. But it speaks of a particular confidence, eh? Because I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor God's children begging bread. That speaks to a relationship that's built on experience. And you know the song, we're going to sing two songs today. And it pretty much sums up my own experience with this group, the Sunshine Echoes. My first 25 years, and I'm giving you an insight into my age, I grew up watching this group, and the first song was, it speaks to, it's hymn number 262, it says there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. It's actually one of those hymns that I grew up listening to this group sing in the late 70s and early 80s. And I didn't know that I would have had the opportunity to be singing with this group, certainly for the last 25 years. And so the second song speaks to the fact that it's pretty much my own experience singing with this group. And having been around for close to say, well, 50 years, this group, there's nothing more to do but to look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so the second song speaks to that place. There's a land beyond the river that we really, really are yearning for today. And so today we're stopped by to just encourage you, saints of God, that irrespective of the trials, irrespective of the, the circumstances you face, to continue to trust Jesus. Continue to keep your eyes on the prize because there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place and Jesus is coming soon. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it is a spirit of the Lord. 
And what hope that one gave us also, the land beyond the river, where we'll have no, no more problems. Now, SNA, mm -hmm. can you believe that a blind lady really wrote those songs? No, Auntie. Yes, she was blind. But guess what? Mm -hmm. She was blind, but she could see. You know what I mean by that? Hmm? Yeah, she could see. Although she was blind to the things of this world, she could see Jesus. And she could see Jesus in all sorts of things. Now, unfortunately, that gives us no excuse. Because all of us can praise God in some way, right? You know what happened to brethren? We can't really see until we can see Jesus. We need to see how loving and forgiving he is. We need to see that he takes care of his people. We need to see that there's something good even in bad situations. Oh. We, we, still, we need to see the needs of people instead of seeing their faults, right? So brethren, mm -hmm. let us ask God to give us eyes so that we can see. As a day gets what time it is. It's story time. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. I have a little shy one right here. I wish to change our mind. All right, so our children today will sing a song for you. <laughs> All right, I just have to leave her.
with us no church Enjoy that story. Me too. Story. All of us seem to enjoy the story. <laughs> and those were the cutest little storytellers. They even caused crowd to come down because I saw people standing on the side and I didn't see them before. <laughs> Praise God. All right, as we are going to learn about another hymn writer. His name is Horatio Stafford. After the presentation, Brother Marvin Ferron will sing. I am Horatia Gates Spafford. I was born in New York on the 20th day of October in 1828 to parents, gazetteer Arthur Horatia Gates Spafford and Elizabeth Hewitt Spafford. 33 years later, on September 5th, 1861, I got married to Anna Larson in Chicago. By profession, I was a lawyer. My wife Anna and I were very active in the Presbyterian Church where I even served as church elder. My wife and I were blessed with five children and considerable wealth. I owned a great deal of property in my hometown. Not unlike Job in the Old Testament of the Bible, tragedy came in great measure to my happy home when four-year-old Horatia Jr., our son, died suddenly of scarlet fever. Then only a year later, in October 1871, a massive fire swept through downtown Chicago, devastating the city, including many of my properties. Two years later, in 1873, my wife and I decided we should take a holiday in England, knowing that my friend the evangelist D.L. Moody would be preaching in the autumn. Unfortunately, I was delayed because of business, so I sent my wife and four remaining children ahead. On the 22nd of November, 1873, while crossing the Atlantic, the vessel my family was in was struck by an iron sailing ship. All four of my daughters perished, but remarkably, Anna survived the tragedy. Those rescued, including Anna, was found unconscious, floating on a plant of wood, subsequently arrived in Cardiff, South Wales. Upon arrival there, Anna immediately sent me a telegram, which included the words, Saved Alone. Receiving Anna's message, I set off at once to reunite with her. One particular day during my voyage, the captain summoned me to the bridge of the vessel, pointing to his charge, explaining that where we were passing was the very spot the vessel had sunk and where my daughters had perished. I returned to my cabin and wrote to him, it is well with my soul. Following this deep tragedy, Anna gave birth to three more children, but she and I were not spared. We encountered even more sadness as on February 11, 1880, our only other son also died 
at the age of four. After a decade of financial loss and personal grief, accompanied by a lack of support from the church community, this began my philanthropic move away from material success toward a lifelong spiritual pilgrimage. Anna and I soon left the Presbyterian congregation and joined Swedish Christians engaged in philanthropic work among the people of Jerusalem. On September 25th, 1888, I died of malaria and was buried in Mount Zion Cemetery in Jerusalem. I now welcome you to listen to one of my favorite songs that encapsulates my tragic life. It is well with my soul. Oh, 
I've been taken to a heavenly place a while ago. Thank you, Jesus. May we all be able to say that it is well with our soul. Church, have you ever thought of writing your own hymn? Did you hear the question, church? Have you ever thought of writing your own hymn? Well, as I said before, hymns are our experiences with God, right? Are based on our experiences with God. And I'm sure that all of us have had some experience with the Lord, right? So write four lines that tell a little about God working in your life. You can... Type it on your phone if you don't have any paper. In the meantime, the Jacks family will sing an original song that Jordan wrote about God. And after the Jacks family come, we'll be singing one of our favorite hymns, Master the Tempest is Raging. So while they're coming, if you have your phone and you have service, please search for the old hymn, Master the Tempest is Raging. And we all are going to get our singing on today. Yes, we want the basses, the tenors, opera, everything coming out today while we're singing that song. So Amen, brethren. 
So that song, let's call him a hymn today, it was penned by Jordan Jack, one of the little girls you saw there. And um, I know that some of you might have been writing your lines, um, but in the meantime, we are going to sing one of our favorite hymns. Now this hymn was written by Marian Baker. I'm going to ask Marvin to come closer and Dainty, Sister Dainty, please come up here also because I have a little assignment for you to do. In this song, Brother Marvin, Sister Dainty, along with the praise team, we're going to be doing it, right? No. What's the name of the song again? Pastor. What do you think inspired this song? What story? The storm on the sea and Jesus was in the ship doing what? Yes, and it was telling us that no matter what storms are on our sea, once Jesus is in the ship, we have nothing to worry about, right? Okay, so we're going to sing and the praise team is going to be leading out. No, where is Brother Marvin? Come, I guess Marvin and um, Emmanuel will be singing this one. So... Ezane, could you please give the instruction for me? All the men will stand and sing the first verse with expression. Uncle Marvin will show the main expressions, then sit and sing the chorus. So, all the men are asked to stand, because they're going to be singing in the first Verse, and I want to hear the robust male voices coming out. And it must sound desperate to you know, like in the ship with Jesus, and the storm is on the sea, and, 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 and some of you can't swim so well, and you feel like you're going to be in problems. And Brother Marvin, I want to see the expression on your face more than anybody else. Yes, so you're going to show them how the men looked when. They realized that there was a storm on the sea. Are we ready to begin? We're going to start. So, men. So, lead up, brother Marvin and men, come. Let's see the fear on their faces. Start now. Come on, man.
up here. So Sister Dainty is going to sing Mass of the Terror is Over. And I want her to just, you know, show the expressions while she's singing it. Come Sister Dainty, let them see that you're, you're happy that the terror is over. Go ahead. in your life. Whatever storm you're experiencing today, Jesus is saying, peace be still. The storm of financial problems, God is saying, peace be still. The storm of conflict in your life, what is Jesus saying? Peace be still. The storm of any form of depression, Jesus is saying, peace be still. If you have violence in your community, Jesus is saying, peace be still. I just want you to rest in the arm of Jesus. And like he slept in the storm, I want us to just, just fall asleep in the comfort of his arms, knowing that God can still any storm in our lives. Now, wasn't that a joyful and worshipful experience? Praise the Lord. All right, so it is time for the spoken word. So we just invite Elder Thompson to come and introduce the speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this, our music day. When we thought of someone to speak and someone who would put proper context to the day and add value to our theme, we couldn't help but consider a former pastor of this church, former conference director, and a teacher, Pastor Lorenzo King. When I contacted him, he willingly, you can applaud, you can applaud. <laughs> when I contacted him, he was willing to share the word with us and a matter of fact he reaffirmed that Sydney was one of his favorite congregation he served us well and is a gifted speaker and very skilled in the word he's one who we have all come to love and appreciate he will be joining us virtually from Vermont USA Pastor King currently lives and works in the United States and is also a doctoral candidate at Boston University 
pursuing a program of study in ministry. He's married to wife Esther, and together they have four children. Pray, brothers and sisters, that the spoken word will bless our hearts today. Just before we hear from God's servant, a special song will be rendered by the youth choir. God bless you.
and we will see more of his fullness. I bring you Christian greetings from Montpelier, Vermont, United States, where the sun is shining brilliantly, but it is a deceitful sun. The temperature is 44 degrees Fahrenheit, and there is no on the ground, but it is a beautiful day, not just because it's a Sabbath day, but because nature is in all of its splendor. I'd like to use this opportunity to say thanks to my colleague and friend, Pastor Nathan Jackson, for affording me the privilege of sharing with you to all the members of the Sydenham Seventh-day Adventist Church and the churches in and, in and around and outside of Spanish Town. May God be with you and may God bless you abundantly. My family brings you greeting. Two of my sons, they are at the, they are in Kingston playing at a music day and one of them just entered from the woods. He, he went out hunting today and I know you might look at that a little funny, but I bring you greetings from him. I commend you for the good work that you are doing as a Christian organization, as a body of Christ. And I want to say a special thank you and congratulations to the host of the service, Sister Sandy, and the child who performed. It was a job well done. I will not be preaching for 15 minutes. I know that Sister Brown preached that it should be a short sermonette, but I read somewhere that sermonettes make Christianettes. Christianettes, sermonettes make Christianettes. And besides that too, my preparation was not within the 15 minutes range. I'm going to need between 20 and maybe 30 minutes, but the word will be good. Pass your seatbelt, pray, and let us go. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of being here to sing, to listen to singing, and to hear your word. Please bless us. Bless the words that shall be presented. May they be a delight to those who hear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My text is Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16. One verse. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. It says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. These are the words of Jesus to his 12 disciples as he prepared to send them off on their first missionary trip. Matthew notes that this was a new development in Jesus' evangelistic thrust. Before this, Jesus was doing the work while the disciples watched. Jesus realized from his involvement in the community that the work was too much for one person, too much even for himself, and that the time had come to expand the work. More resources were needed to engage the task at hand. More troops had to be called up and deployed. The watchers had to become workers. Those who are on the sidelines commentating on the conflict had to be moved to the front line where the action was. The spectators had to become participants in the field of play. If you are in Matthew chapter 10, you will observe that verses 35 to 39 of our verses 35 to 39 of the previous chapter, that's Matthew 10, paints a picture of what Jesus was doing. Let me read those verses for you to give a little context. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogue, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness 
and every disease among the people. Jesus was dispensing life and health and learning. Notice that. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. This verse tells us that he was compassionately concerned when he witnessed the absence of leadership among the people and the chaos that resulted from that leadership boy. Then he said to his disciples, verse 37, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The disciples must have taken Jesus literally and prayed. Because in verse 1 of chapter 10, verse 1 of chapter 10, it says that Jesus took action to address the shortage of the mission field. Let me read it for you. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power and clean spirit to cast them out. All manner of and all manner restricted and the mission of peace. Who wants you to know two things here? The Bible says that Jesus called them and he gave them power. That is, he called them and he empowered them. Called to what? And empowered with and for what, you may ask. First of all, they were called to him. That's what the Bible says. When he had called unto him, when he had called unto him, he gave them power. So know that they were called to him and not to a task. I respectfully submit to you this afternoon that the work of God begins with being friends with the Son of God. This relationship legitimizes all subsequent efforts. So he called them to himself. The other thing is he empowered them. He empowered them. Jesus equipped them with the same tools that he possessed. They received power to preach, power to teach, and power to heal. Why did Jesus not to be less than it. And just in case you might be wondering, what is this presentation doing in a music day? This has everything, this has everything to do with music. Because the Bible says there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repented. And we read also in Revelation that the angels will just stand by and listen because they are unable to join in the songs of redemption. So what I'm saying is fitting nicely into the context of singing, the context of music. Evangelism is a musical activity. So let us be engaged. In verse 2 of chapter 10, Matthew uses a word that signifies a change in the status of the disciple in relation to the work that Jesus was doing. And if you are reading from your Bible, Matthew chapter 10, it says, Know the names of the twelve, the twelve apostles. In verse 1, it says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, a transition is made in the status of the apostles between verse 1 and verse 2. They are no longer called the twelve. They are called apostles. Why? Jesus calls them apostles because they are sent ones. They were sent to work in his field. And notice, their names are listed. The names of the twelve are listed. And their names are listed 
because there are no participants in an event on which the door of history would swing. Please note that even Judas was named among them. Having our names written down as participants in a divine enterprise is good, but it is better to have our names written in the book of life. Is your name written there, says one of our songs. Make sure your name is written there. Notice too that God, all the disciples were ordinary men. But God gives ordinary people the opportunity to do extraordinary things. He gave Judas a chance. I am sure he's ready and he's willing to give you a chance too as he gave me. And I say to you, make good use of your God-given chance. Jesus then outlined some operational strategies that the apostles should bring to their work. What he shared with them in verses 5 to 42 was not just good advice. They were the rules of engagement. Jesus sent them out to work. And we refer to the sending out as a commission. A commission is not just the earning, the earnings that a worker gets from work done. Like those of us who have sold insurance. A commission is an authorization to carry out a specific action or a set of actions in the name of another. So we can commission a painter to do a mural in the Seventh-day Adventist Church at Sidina. That's what a commission is. It is, it, it is empowerment, it is permission to carry out an action or a set of action in the name of another. So Jesus called his disciples, he empowered them, and he commissioned them. Interestingly, there are many Christians who seem to believe that there is only one gospel commission. That's the one found in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. But I'm here to tell you this afternoon that there are at least three gospel commissions, at least three of them. The best known or the best recognized one is the one in Matthew chapter 19, uh, Matthew chapter 28, 19 to 20. But here are the others. Matthew 10, verse 1 to 16. That's the first gospel commission. And that was given to the 12. Then in Luke chapter 10, verse 1 to 19, we have another commission. And that was given to the 70. And then in Matthew chapter 28, that was given to the disciples after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I would like at this time to direct your attention to the first gospel commission. It was used our scripture reading. Behold, I send you out. Notice that. Behold, I send you out in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as dumb. It is Jesus who is speaking. He is speaking to the twelve and he's speaking through them to the entire community of believers in all ages and in all places. Jesus in this verse speaks as Emmanuel. He speaks as God with us. He speaks as God's representative to us. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1, in the first gospel, verse 16 I mean, in the first gospel commission, Jesus does two things. One, he commissioned, and two, he cautions. Let me say that again. In the first gospel commission, Jesus does two things. He commissions and he cautions. I'm going to use some time now to focus on the mission. At least three characteristics. Number one, and I want you to listen to me carefully. The commission was invasive like the star trek enterprise 
The twelve were to boldly go where no one has ever gone before, conquering new worlds and civilization. Jesus said, Behold, I send you out. From here, I'm sending you out. Jesus has also said, I am the source of your power, and I'm the source of your authority. Whatever the twelve said, whatever they did, whatever they encountered was at his pleasure. Jesus was sending them out in order that they may go in, into people's home, into people's lives, into people's relationship, into their understanding. The commission was invasive. And I have to be careful that I do not spend too much time developing this idea. My time is very limited. The second thing about the commission, it was dangerous. It was very, very dangerous. I sent you forth a sheep among wolves. I send you forth a sheep among wolves. Wolves are beautiful creatures. They even have an innocent and friendly appearance, but they are everything else except innocent and friendly. Wolves are extremely dangerous predators. They are not to be treated as pets. Human beings do not want to be in wolves' spaces. Neither do they want to be where wolves are. When wolves mingle with men in uncontrolled spaces, it is likely that it will result in pain. It is dangerous, always dangerous, to be among wolves because a wolf might just be thinking about having you for supper. So the commission was dangerous. And mark you, it was Jesus who commissioned them. The commission seemed irrational. I'm not saying it is irrational. It seemed irrational. Did Jesus know what he was doing? I'm sending you among wolves. A hundred sheep cannot stand in the presence of one wolf. So what does this mean? He's sending, sending them out to be slaughtered. He's sending them out to die, to be killed. The metaphor presents the disciples as the underdogs, as the under sheep. I send you forth as wolves. They as sheep. What is happening to you, King? I send you forth as sheep among wolves. The sheep were not favored to win. The power structure, the power structures were aligned against them. The establishment did not and would not approve them. The policy makers would not take their interest into consideration when formulating public policy. They were among wolves and among wolves in sheep clothing. They were not protected from extreme violence, bodily mutilations, rape, genocide, kidnapping, slavery, or any other form among evil, of evil. They were among wolves, and no sheep can live safely among wolves. Surely Jesus must have known that, yet he sent them out. The commission seemed irrational. But other than the commission, Jesus said, Be ye among wolves, wise as serpents, and harmless as dogs. So I'm going to touch on the caution now. The caution asks the twelve to model the snake. And you will recall that the snake is an evil creature. It is associated with the fall of Adam and Eve and for the corruption and ultimate um, takeover of death of the human family. The dove, on the other hand, is a gentle animal. It is associated with the receding flood. Remember when Noah sent for that dove, it didn't return. Noah knew from that that it was time for him to exit the ark. So in saying that the disciples should be as wise as serpents and harmless as dogs. Jesus was promoting the virtues of wisdom and gentleness. He wants his disciples to embrace 
and exhibit those qualities. They were important for their survival and for the efficiency and effectiveness with which they did their work. I ask you, dear brothers and sisters, as practicing Christians, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, do you have wisdom? Do you have gentleness? And what are these spiritual treasures, you may ask? I have defined wisdom as a judicious application of knowledge or common sense. It is a judicious application of knowledge or common sense. Wisdom is not always about knowledge. It is about common sense. And common sense has become uncommonly or commonly uncommon. We have to do what we can to reverse that. And gentleness is the ability to think, to hear, to speak, to touch, to believe, to understand, to laugh, to be without harshness. If you lack these qualities, how do you develop them? They cannot be bought at Walmart or on Amazon or at any supermarket in Jamaica. So how do you access these spiritual gifts? Apostle James tells us that if anyone lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And Paul tells us in Galatians 5, verse 22, that the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. Gentleness. Amen. Amen. Like Solomon, we need wisdom and gentleness so that we can mediate in conflicts. And conflicts are many in the communities in which you live. Even where I live, conflicts are many. So we need wisdom and gentleness so that we can mediate in conflicts. Like Daniel, we need wisdom to negotiate with mega power brokers successfully. And if you want to develop negotiation skills, read the book of Daniel. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that you are among wolves and not among goats. The goats might butt you, but they can't eat you. Remember that. Like Mary, the mother of Jesus, we need wisdom to respond appropriately when our mission of destiny is declared to us. So the angel came and said to Mary, you shall get pregnant, you shall be with child. And the only one which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. It was a moment of destiny. It came to Mary, a 15-year-old girl the most. But Mary was wise enough to say, Let it be to your servant according to your word. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We need wisdom and we need gentleness. Wisdom involves knowing. In fact, wisdom, wisdom involves knowing. Knowing and wisdom are related. Wisdom is the elder cousin to knowledge. Expressed differently, wisdom is a product of application of knowledge. Now, as Jesus sends out the sheep among wolves, they need to have wisdom, they need to have understanding, they need to have gentleness. There are some things that sheep should know intuitively as they go among the wolves. I tell you this and hasten to my conclusion. Number one, the sheep must remember this. Know and always remember who you are. Let me pause a little. Know and always remember who you are. You are a herbivore in a carnivorous world. You have no claws. And you're at the bottom of the food chain. You cannot run long enough and far enough to keep the predators away. Always remember who you are. Jesus says, I send you a sheep. You're a sheep among wolves. The other thing, know your environment. Your environment, the gospel field, where we work where we go to sing among wolves. It is a place where the beast of terror come to play and pray, P-R-E-Y. 
those bees like the taste of blood and they are specially configured to slaughter their prey. You cannot play with them because you do not have the tools of death that they do. So when you are among wolves, you must always be on guard. It is not a place to vacation. It is a place to fear. It is a place of danger and violent death. The third thing, no, or the fourth thing rather, do not allow yourself to be redefined by any other who is operating inside or outside your environment. Remember who you are. Who are you? You are a sheep. So remember, you are not a cow. You are not a rhinoceros. You are not an elephant. And by no stretch of the imagination are you a lion. So beware of flattery. Don't let any other sheep tell you that you are a lion. I do not allow anybody else outside of that field to tell you that you are a nice tiger. You are a sheep. Do not yield to the temptation to be who you are not. That was what brought sin into the world. You eat and you shall be as gods and your eyes shall be open. Men are made to be men, not to be gods. Do not yield to the temptation to be who we are not. Be aware or beware of flattery. It is better to be a poor original than an excellent copy. That last statement is not an original statement. I copied it from somewhere. Do not wear wolf's clothing to go in disguise. The wolf can smell you. So do not allow yourselves to be redefined. And the other thing you must know, know what is expected of you. You are expected to be wise and to be gentle. Wisdom is not an option. It is an expectation. It is an absolute necessity. There's no excuse for stupidity. Only extended learning, you stay in the learning process longer and you will be forgiven by God. And gentleness is an operational requirement even when dealing with wolves, think about that. And more so when dealing with fellowship. Fellowship. We need to learn to be gentle with each other. Gentleness highlights the qualitative difference between the community of wolves and the community of sheep. Of sheep. And my prayer is today is that may God May wisdom enable you not to irritate the wolves. Talk to them calmly. Talk to them gently. And may gentleness cause you to develop the techniques of peaceful coexistence for the gospel's sake. Then the other thing you need to know, know that survival in a hostile environment is not the object of the mission. Jesus does not send you to show how well you can survive among wolves. That is not the object. That's not the purpose. Jesus knows what he's about. And the mission is about your salvation as it is about the salvation of the wolves. The mission purifies, it refines, and it orients the mind and the way of life to God. Jesus knows that the only thing that guarantees survival is a willingness to disengage from everything and everyone in life, even of life itself. That is why he says in verse 38 of Matthew 10, if you are not prepared to give up your cross, if you are not prepared to take up your cross and follow him daily, you cannot be his disciple. He said, if you, are, if you are not willing to die, you are not prepared to be his disciple either. And finally, know 
that the one who sent you into wolf territory, he knows where you are and he cares about you. Does Jesus care? Oh yes, he cares. He knows about your griefs. He knows about your sorrows. He knows about the danger you are in. Jesus knows the condition under which you labor. He knows the risk to which you are exposed. He was exposed to those same risks too, but to a greater extent. If you think that Jesus didn't come among wolves, then you are mistaken. He faced the wolves when he descended from heaven into a planetary chaos, and he had no guarantee of personal survival. If he had a guarantee of personal survival, then everything that happened on Calvary that weekend, everything is the greatest fake of the universe. If he knew ahead of time, oh, I can do this, I can suffer, I can allow them to kill me because it is guaranteed that I will be resurrected. Not at all. He had no such guarantee. Jesus was heaven's good shepherd dispatched among ravenous wolves and they killed him. They murdered him. So when Jesus is sending you, sending us among wolves, he knows what he's doing. And he knows too that your weakness and your vulnerability do not disqualify you from the job at hand. Behold, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. Jesus has called you too. He has commissioned you as well. And unbelievably, he has empowered you as he has empowered me. Jesus has called you to serve dangerous people in dangerous places. And you in Sidina, you have some dangerous places around you. Jesus has sent us to those communities as well. His people are in those places too. And they must be reached. The life-saving gospel. Did Jesus make a mistake when he called you? And do you have what it takes to be a sheep? in a wolf's world. I think you have. And my final question to you, would you like to experience the power and the joy of living in total detachment from self-preservation? I think you should want to do that. Our survival among wolves is not our desire to stay alive. Our survival is shaped and it is determined by our ability to detach from self, everything that is selfish, from self-preservation. Jesus says he who loses his life will gain it, but if you save your life, you will lose it. So yes, yes, you can be a sheep in a wolf's world. Yes, you can. If you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus, you can. If you understand that hardship, not comfortable living, is your badge of identity with Christ, yes, you can. If you know that God will take care of you, whatever the time, you can. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can. If you can see the beauties of the promised land, from a far off, yes, you can, you can. Behold, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as dogs. As you labor among the wolves, remember this, transformation will take place. Some of those wolves will become sheep and they will bring other sheep and if we be faithful one day we will stand on the sea of glass when the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb will be sung. It is a song of our redemption. It is a song of our struggles. It is a song of our victory. It is a song of our overcoming. The angel population will not be able to join it. It will be a glorious song raising the vault of heaven. I 
want to be there. What about you? Behold, I send you forth a sheep among wolves. Let us go. Let us go with enthusiasm. Let us go with energy. Let us go with everything that we have. The Good Shepherd is on our side. He will defend us. He will protect us. He has already saved us. Behold, I send you forth a sheep among wolves. Let us go. Father in heaven, bless your people today and grant that each one will accept the gospel commission and do what he or she is gifted to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. to God. 
We know not the hour of the Master's appearing, yet signs are foretell that the moment is nearing when he shall return. It's a promise most cheering, but we know. such a refreshing, refreshing experience that we've had. SNA? Yes. I hope you receive the blessings that you came seeking. Please remember that God gives a song for every situation. Amen. And brethren, we cannot, 
write a hymn or the writers could write a hymn unless they had an experience with Christ. Many persons get baptized into the church, but unfortunately many of us didn't get baptized into Jesus. Many of us came in the church as enemies of God to do the yes. biddings of the devil. Can you believe it? To sow discord and to cause problems in the church. And because of that, we are not able to express the goodness of the Lord because we don't know what it is to have that experience with God. But I'm going to ask us, let us ask God to help us to find him. And we have to seek with all our hearts. And may each day that we walk, that we talk, will be a hymn of praise to the Lord. Youth Choir is going to be singing, and after the Youth Choir sings, Elder Mattis will give us a benediction, and that will be goodbye from Music Day. God be with you till we meet again. Okay. <laughs>
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is what? Within me, bless his holy name. For what? I was glad when they say unto me what the psalmist David said. Let us do what? Go in the house of the Lord. And we are here today because we would have what? Eated the command and we would have been blessed. For there was what? No place like what? This place anywhere near what? This place for this was the place this morning. And we want to give God thanks and praise that he has allowed us to be transported where? In heavenly places. And we are rejoicing. I'm going to ask you to stand as we have our closing prayer. Holy Father, we give you thanks and praise that you would have inspired men, women, boys, and girls in their different situation to pen these hymns so they can bring comfort and joys to our hearts today. Bless us as we depart one from another, but not from your presence, and bring us back where we continue to worship you and give you the highest praise, we pray in Jesus' name. Jesus, Lord, with blessings we pray. As from thy worship we go our way, guide and life's fun, take up through the day, save in thy kingdom, thy bids I pray. Right, you may be seated. Remember, we meet right here back at 4.30 p.m. 4.30. So you grab a snack and we meet back at 4.30 this afternoon where we we'll conclude our music day program right here at the Sydenham Seventh-day Adventist Church. We want to thank you for coming. We want to thank you for worshiping with us today. We want to thank those who have joined us online we want to ask you to join us back at 4.30 as we continue this worship service. Also remember, for those of you who need tickets in support of the Twickenham, in support of the Twickenham Seventh-day Adventist Church, for they to purchase their church building. The concert is tonight. The tickets are with me. You can uh, get tickets from me so come and get your ticket and even if you can't afford to go we ask you to come and purchase a ticket in support of the cause thank you
so, so. 